All right, let's get started. We're going to jump right back in here. We were in Romans chapter 3. And we had, I'm sorry, Romans chapter, Romans chapter 12. We were in verse 3. Yeah, sorry about that. So verse 3, he says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now notice, he had to tell them not to think more highly than they should. Right? Now, when I first read that, I thought, you know, what's amazing to me is that most people, if they deal with any type of self-esteem issue, it is low self-esteem. Right? And now, science says... And, and I can see some truth to it. Even people that tend to have a, what, they, what you would call a superiority complex or uh, they, they think very highly of themselves, that can, or even an arrogance or a conceitedness, that is almost always a cover-up for a low self-esteem. Right. Oh, wow. Now think about that. And that. That's amazing in itself. And, but here, here's where he says, notice this. He says, uh, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought. He doesn't say don't think of your, highly of yourself. He says, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. Yeah. And, I start, and when I read that, because I know God doesn't just throw, out, throw around words. I mean, every word is specific and there's a reason for it. And one of the things, as I started reading more and more in the epistles and in uh, dealing with the new man and who we are in Christ, I started realizing no wonder he had to calm them down. Because when you start finding out everything God said about you, That's right. I mean, if you, if you did not really had, have his spirit, you would think more highly of yourself than you ought. Now, and, and let me tell you, the fastest way to think more highly of yourself than you ought is to think of yourself more highly than someone else. See, it doesn't take a whole lot. I'm not talking about walking around being arrogant and conceited and that kind of stuff. That's pretty obvious that that's not the spirit of God. But even in the church today, you see people who, because of a gift or a quote-unquote anointing, or whatever it is, you know, in the Christian church, they put themselves above other Christians, you know. Or, or okay, let's, let's hit home. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, I'm spirit-filled. Yeah, I speak into, I believe the whole Bible. Not like those, yeah. you fill in the denomination. You see, that's a way of thinking yourself more highly than you ought. Because the Bible says if a man, and I'm not saying any group or anything, I'm saying, but let's just say, it says if, if, you, if a brother is in, uh, you know, if he has a, if he's in weak faith, you don't put him down because of it. You bear his burden. You help him, right? And you raise his faith. You you give him faith. I mean, you you teach him why he should have faith. You don't look down on him and go, well, I got faith and you don't. You know, that was one of the problems in some of the groups that I was around growing up. Is that, man, you know, if you you if you got sick, it's because you had little faith and everybody knew about it and. You know, well, I'm not like, you know, I got, I got faith because I don't get sick. And they obviously don't have faith because they do. That was a big thing. And it made it where people, you know, if they got sick, they didn't come to church for prayer. They hid, yeah. you know, because they didn't want anybody to know they didn't have faith. You know, it was that because that's everybody would look down on them. And so and, and it, it made it hard for people to actually grow, right, because they had to hide that stuff. So anyway, thank God we got past that. Amen. So here he says now. Uh, not to think more highly of yourself uh, than he ought, ought to think, but to think soberly, right? Now, sober, to be sober-minded, uh, you know, obviously we're not talking about any type of intoxication per se, but when he talks about being sober-minded, he thinks he's talking about thinking rationally, thinking uh, accurately, thinking critically, not being critical, but decisive, right? Being able to look at something and not being arrogant in the thing, but actually walking where you ought to walk, right? Being right where, thinking exactly what you should be thinking about yourself, right? Now, it says, but to think soberly according, and, and uh, if you know this, you'll think soberly, right? If you really know this. According as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, I will have to tell you that the word the there is not in the Greek, so it doesn't say the measure of faith. But now the idea would be uh, that it is there, but it's not in the actual Greek because they didn't need it. They understood the grammar there. And he was saying to God has dealt to every man a measure or the measure of faith. All right. So uh, and, it, and, and honestly, it wouldn't matter even if it was there because the measure of faith, even if it was the smallest measure. Well, we know the smallest measure can move a mountain. Oh, yeah. 
right? So it's not about that. It's not about how much faith necessarily there. He's just saying, well, and the reason he's saying it, he, he says, think soberly, think accurately, because you don't have anything that anybody else doesn't have. Amen? And once you realize, and that's one of the things that we talk about in the DHD, one of the reasons uh, that, because I was raised around a lot of the anointed teaching, the gift teaching, a lot of these different things, and had I, be, had I bought into some of how that's taught, then the natural thing would have been for me to think, oh, you know, I have John Lake's anointing, or I have this gift, and, th and that would have been the natural thing. But because we saw this early on, and I realized, you know, when, it, when we talk about uh, not thinking more high of yourself than you ought, actually, we talk about that as one of the 15 secrets of divine healing. And the reason you don't think of yourself as anything more than anybody else is because anybody can do what Amen. you can do. If everybody can do what you can do, how can you think of yourself as something? Right. Amen? And so, now we're all wired differently. We all have different functions in the body of Christ. But the bottom line is, in any of the things that we are told to do, any believer can do them. Right? And because of that, we shouldn't think more highly of ourselves uh, you know, than, than anybody else. So, it's very simple. Now, notice, uh, here I do mention 1 Corinthians 2.16 where it says, For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? This is a, quoting an Old Testament verse. But then it says, But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. So the real key is not, well, you know, let's get the mind of the Lord on it. No, you don't get the mind of the Lord. You access it. Right? You don't have to get it. If you're born again, you have the mind of Christ. So you don't have to get something. Okay, let me give you another verse to back this up. In... Um, 1 John 4, 17, it says that here we have boldness in the day of judgment. Why? Because as he is, so are we, so are, present tense, we, in this world. Is that right? Yeah. So whatever he is, we are now, here, right? In yeah. this world. It also says that not only, what well, it says that if we are, uh, if we're people of faith, I'm trying to paraphrase to keep it short, it says if we're people of faith, then we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, right? Joint heirs with Christ means that whatever Jesus has, we have, right? That's what a joint heir is. So if Jesus, if we are joint heirs with him, and if he is, if we are as he is right now, then we couldn't have anything other than the mind of Christ, Amen. right? Because if he has the mind of Christ and we're joint heirs, we have the mind of Christ. Right? Now that's just spiritual logic, but it's also scripture, right? which is always good when you can put the two together. So, Now, notice here, uh, we're going to be looking a lot at facts concerning the mind of man. We're going to be looking at the function of the mind, uh, and, and especially, I'm going to, hopefully, during this time, I'll be able to uh, delineate or, or define more accurately the functioning of the human mind and the function of the mind of Christ. But I will also, because we have to differentiate, there's a lot of things here we've got to look at. I'll probably end up using the dry erase board here pretty quick just to draw some of these things out so you can write them down. <clears throat> we have to remember, when Adam was created, he was smart enough to be able to name every animal. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so he named, and because and God told him, whatever you call them, that's what they're going to be called. He didn't say, call them what I tell you to call them. Right. Adam wasn't sitting there and go, well, what do you want to call this one? Well, let's call this one. He wasn't doing it. He, whatever, when they came up, he looked at it and called it whatever it was. And whatever it was, that's what it is. Now, I personally, don't make this a doctrine because it's not a, you know, nobody's salvation depends on it. But I personally believe that what Adam called them is what they are called today in the species and genus and subgenus, all that, I believe it's that more so than just, oh, that's a lion. Oh, that's a tiger. Oh, that, see, I believe that he actually called that because in we, what we call a tiger or a lion, let's say a lion, what we call a lion, other countries call a tiger or a panther or say, you see what I'm saying? They have different words. So it's not the same everywhere. But when you look at the genus of it or the species, that's the same no matter what country you're in. 
So for that thing to be called what Adam called it, it has to be the name that's known throughout humanity, not just in one group. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. All right, it makes sense to me. Again, it's not a doctrine that I'm going to, you know, I wouldn't debate over it, right? But it just makes sense to me, right? So anyway, all right. So, but we're going to be talking about, because what we're looking at, we have, you have Adam, whose mind was phenomenal, right? Which makes it even more reason why he was so guilty whenever he didn't obey God, right? Because to whom much is given, much is required, right? And if Adam had that kind of brain, he should have had that much sense, right? So that's why the guilt was so strong. So anyway, uh, then you have Adam before the fall. Then you have Adam after the fall, right? And, and it was amazing because after the fall, man's intelligence started declining. And matter of fact, when uh, I was with Dr. Sumrall, one of the things that he pointed out was whenever he went to uh, different countries and he went to the UK at one point and he went to the uh, Museum of Natural History. He tried to do that everywhere he went, but in the, I believe it was in London, at the Museum of Natural History, they have uh, some archaeology, uh, archaeological uh, things there that show how people lived actually in Ur of the Chaldees, which is where Abraham was from. And when you go back to look at them, when Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees, they actually had hot and cold running water in their houses at Ur of the Chaldees. I mean, it was, it was a nice place, right, uh, compared to the time especially. But do you realize we didn't have hot and cold running water in our houses until the end of the 19th century, you know, coming into the early 1900s, and even sometimes then, not for a while. So why did they have it in Ur of the Chaldees, but we didn't have it until, you know, roughly almost 2,000 years after Jesus was here? And you know, they didn't have it in Jesus' day. It showed that man's intellect degraded over time, but it took a while for it to degrade. Now, we know when Adam sinned, God said, the day you sin, that's the day you'll die. Well, we know he died spiritually because he didn't die physically. Right. So he died spiritually so there was a cutoff of the life of God, which cut off life going to the brain or going in actually the mind. And so it would cut that life off. And because of that, a person's knowledge, which was light, became darkness. Okay. And whenever you look at words light and dark and darkness, and don't let your light become dark, things like that, because light can become dark. Whenever you look at those words, it's talking about the spiritual aspect, and it's always talking about knowledge every time. And so that's another thing. Christians don't like to talk about knowledge. They, you know, well, the first thing Pentecostals bring up, well, you know, knowledge puffeth up, but love edifies. Okay, well, knowledge can puff up, but not if it's the knowledge of the Spirit and not if it is knowledge by the Spirit or from the mind of Christ. Amen? And say, now, the knowledge itself, okay, reading the Word of God and getting the knowledge of God does not puff you up, okay? What puffs you up is the arrogance that was already in you, and now you learned a little something and think you're something because you learned a little something, right? And so it's not, it's not the knowledge itself that puffs up, but it is the, what is in the person that because of the knowledge, they get puffed up. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Now, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the and we're going to talk about the mind of man, the mind of Christ, uh, the mind of the spirit, and I'm going to show you how the mind of man has degenerated and it degenerated to a point, and then there became a point where it started to increase again. And actually, when it started to increase, it's amazing because they even call the Middle Ages they call it the Dark Ages. Right? Why? Because that was the time whenever the knowledge of God was the least known around the world. The Dark Ages directly correspond to how much the Word of God, when the Word of God was taken out of the hands of the common people, the Dark Ages started. Right? So whenever you remove the light of God's Word, darkness sweeps in. Right? And so we're going to see how a lot of things happen. And then there was the Age of Enlightenment. Right? And the Renaissance, when people started thinking and, and amazing revelation started coming out. And you know what's amazing to me even today is that for centuries, 
All people of science that made the greatest discoveries were people of faith. They were Christian, you know, to whatever degree they understood Christianity, but they, they claimed Christianity as their faith. And they almost always had a direct relationship with God. And it is, it is amazing. You read some of their diaries and things, stuff that nowadays you don't hear about in school because they don't like to give credit to faith for anything. But the fact is that most of these people that had the amazing discoveries and inventions were people of faith. And now, just as a, a we'll talk about this probably later more, or a little more later on. When I first started doing research on healing and contacted John Lake's daughter and her husband, and then they put me into contact with a little over 100 people that had been in Dr. Lake's church. One of the things that stood out to me most and really kind of probably got my attention on some of this was that I would be talking to people in their mid, sometimes even late 90s. And when we started talking, they were able to give dates, places, names of people, their family, their children's names. I mean, amazing information, especially in this day and age of somebody at that age. And so I started noting that. And after a couple of times, I started talking to them. Say, you know, it's amazing that you remember these places and times and dates and all these kind of things. And then, but then I also remember a lot of people can remember way back and they can't remember yesterday. <coughs> you know, that there's a short-term memory problem. And so I started asking them a few other questions and found out that their memory was the same yesterday or, you know, 80 years before. And so I started asking them about this. How is it that you remember these things? How is it you remember names and these places and the different things? Because they would tell me what sermon John Lake preached on a certain day. You know, I mean, things that were going on and they remember this and they, they would talk. And, but a lot of it had to do with it was tied to emotions. It was tied to different things, which you will see gives memory stronger, uh, a stronger basis and stronger foundation. But the main thing is every one of them, when I asked them the question, they all said exactly the same thing. They said, Dr. Lake used to tell us to recognize the fact that while he's preaching, the word of God is spirit and life. And if he speaks the word of God, spirit and life is going into us. And he said, they said, not just into our body to heal us, but into our soul. And that the word of God would permeate every cell of our brain. And therefore the life of God was not just in our spirit, but in our brains. Amen. And because of that, we would be able to remember. And they used to use the scripture, the memory of the righteous is blessed. Uh, which could, that could be taken a couple of different ways. But the way, the way they applied it was that they were righteous and therefore their memory was blessed and that they had great memory. And I'm telling you, I have not found another group of people that had the memory of those people. And so I, I firmly believe what Dr. Lake said. I even found places where he talked about it himself to where uh, the brain and, and actually... And, and here's the amazing, again, I, this is still kind of the introduction, so I'm still sharing some of these things with you just to sh kind of show you where we're going. <clears throat> One of the things that, that they said, and I'm talking 30, almost 40, well, a good 30 years ago when I was talking to these people. And they said, <clears throat> Dr. Lake said that whenever he spoke these words, they were spirit and life. So as we connect, and now they didn't use these exact terms, I'm using some of these terms myself, but... It was as if whenever they were listening to the Spirit, if they were connected to the Spirit, it was, there was a constant flow of life and information. Not just by what he was saying, but if he's saying by the Spirit of God, then that flow was by the Spirit of God, not just what John Lake was saying. And John Lake, let, let me give you the example. John Lake may say 10 words, but in those 10 words, the Holy Spirit says 100 words. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, when not too long, well, not too long ago now, when I started looking at the mind renewal, I started realizing that what happened is that if the, the, when we talk about the Spirit of God, it also talks about the mind of the Spirit. So the Spirit has a mind. And if we are plugged in to the Spirit of God, we're plugged into the mind of Christ, which is the mind of the Spirit. Now think about this. Not that we ever unplug from God. But let's say you are raised in church, not born again. 
your spirit is dead because of sin and trespasses. You're not, you don't have the life of God in you, but you have the, the, the spirit because we know that it is the spirit and the word spoken that allows a person to believe and to change. And they, then they give their heart to Christ and then they, as we would say, they get plugged into God. Did everything I just say make sense? Yes. Right? So notice we say they got plugged into God. Before they got born again, they could hear the word of God. They could even understand. I ought to live this way. I should do this. I should treat my neighbor as myself. I should do good to others. People, they can know that, even unborn again. They can know it and know it's right. And to a degree, they can live it. They'll always fall short, but they can live it out. Right? They, can, they, they, they know they're supposed to and they can know they can try to and they can succeed in some areas. Can we agree with that? Yes. But now think about that. That's them not even being plugged into the Spirit. Right? So there is that capacity to know, to recognize truth, and to follow it to a degree. But yet, if their spirit is not changed, if their basic nature has not been changed, they will constantly fall short of the glory of God. Amen? Are, are we good so far? Yes. All right. But now imagine this. Imagine when they get plugged into God. They get born again. Now, Jesus said he was the vine and we are the branch. Now think about this. If Jesus is the vine, the vine grows up and then there's branches off the vine. And the reason we have life is because we are connected to the vine. Is that right? Yeah. That same life flowing in the vine flows through the branch. Right? Yes. Now, take this from farming and gardening to science. What would be the natural connection or corollary in technology? The internet. <clears throat> When I grew up, there was no internet. If you wanted to know something, you bought a book, you went to the library, right? You had to go down there in the library. I mean, for me, that was the, you know, hallowed halls, you know what I mean? Because you could go down, and if, I mean, all knowledge was there. At least all the knowledge you could get a hold of. I mean, if you wanted to know something, you go to the library. I remember door-to-door -door salesmen selling uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, right? And I mean, they had this whole set. And I remember you could even buy one a month, yeah. right? And you pay a certain amount per month and you get, you know, A to B or, you know, just A or what it was. <laughs> it's amazing. It, was, it, you know, it took you 26 months to, to be able to find what you were looking for, you know. <laughs> but, but it was there, you know, you, but it was in that form. And it was isolated. The library was isolated at that point. And I remember whenever they first started getting internet, even at the library, that made a whole difference. And then when, then when internet started becoming uh, more common in life, all of a sudden, you didn't have to go to the library anymore. Why? Because you were plugged in. Man, and, and you realize you didn't know everything, but you had access to everything, right? You didn't know it, it wasn't in you, but it was at your fingertips. And you could read it and find it, whatever, on any topic, you could find, you know, 20 different views. Okay, you just had to decide which view was right, basically. So you still had to think. But now think about that. What if it is similar? Because here's the thing. Man cannot create anything not like himself. Right. Everything man creates functions the way man's mind thinks. Okay, these cameras, they function the way man's mind works concerning the eyes. They focus, they go back, they, 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 and the reason they work that way is because a man's mind created them. So if a man's mind created them, they have to function logically in tune with man's mind. Does that make sense? Yep. Now, now think about that. Okay, so we, we can agree that a computer, how does a computer work? Do you know why you can work a computer? Because it makes sense, because it is based on how the human mind works. So even if you've never touched a computer, you can sit down at it and it might take you some time, but you would be able to, if you knew, okay, a mind created this, so it's gonna function like a mind. So, okay, let me think, how do I think? That's how that computer is gonna work. 
The difference is you are far smarter than that computer. There has not been a computer built yet that can do even one-tenth as much as a human mind, a human brain working with a mind can do, right? That's why computers, even the terminology, uh, memory, right? Even these terminology that we have uh, works along the same line. So there, in other words, everything the human creates, it creates in alignment with the mind, okay? Now, but we are created in the likeness and image of God. Do you have that? And because, but then that knowledge and that connection was lost. But now when we get born again, we get reconnected. We get plugged back into the internet, also known as the Holy Spirit. And whenever you get plugged back into the Holy Spirit internet, now your entire, now the way, the way you think, you get this, your mind is created to think in alignment with how God's mind thinks. It was created that way. You get that? Whenever man fell, Adam's mind worked the way God's mind worked. Why? Because it was in, he was made in his likeness, his image. And it's the same thing today. So whenever you think, now, okay, let me put it this way. If you're going to think with the mind of Christ, the mind of Christ means that it has to come through. Okay, here, the Bible says we have the mind of Christ. It does not say we have the brain of Christ. But we have the mind of Christ. But the mind of Christ had to work in the brain of Christ. Right. right? So the brain of Christ had to be able to function and keep up with the mind of Christ. Right. Now you have the mind of Christ. That means that your brain has to be able to work and function the way the mind of Christ can function. Yes. Do you get that? Now what happened was it's kind of like Windows 3.0, remember? Mm -hmm. And then it got upgraded. Well, many people are still trying to work without the upgrade, right? But when you get born again, you get upgraded. Amen? And you get upgraded to the mind of Christ. And when you get upgraded to the mind of Christ, all the applications of Christ work. Amen? All right, got to take a break. If you are considering partnering with us and would like to support our mission, please visit jglm.org forward slash partners. Proceeds will go toward the cost of the television broadcast and our mission work around the world. <laughs>